An Introduction to Edgar Allan Poe by Hervey Allen When Edgar Allan Poe died under miserable and tragic circumstances in Baltimore in 1849, the disorder of the latter years of his life was amply reflected in the astonishing disarray and scatterment of his writings. By nature a precise, delicate, and pedantic writer, one of the ablest editors of his time, the unmerciful disaster which followed fast and followed faster, that species of hard luck which is the subtle result of a nervous ineptitude to cope with practical affairs, continued to, continue to dog both the memory of his personality and the editing of his works. The aftermath of Poe's death was a long and intricate story full of the sound and fury of a controversy about the nature of the man's personality, his loves and misfortunes, and for years it was a tale told by idiots, male and female, in which incredible oceans of slushy sentimentality, bathos and wishy-washy hyper hysteria broke in waves of froth over the submerged rocks of fact. It would be useless, even ludicrous, to rehearse that story, here even in outline, for it is the character of Poe's writings, rather than, rather than the man himself, with which this volume should uh, interest us. And we're referring to a volume of the Tales of Edgar Allan Poe, um, first edition published by Random House, 1944. Now, cont now continuing. Suffice it to say, at the time of his death, his reputation suffered one of the major misfortunes which can overtake the fame of any author. The result of the labor of a lifetime, two decades of continuous and persistent writing, both in verse and prose, lay scattered in the pages of obscure, provincial, female, and piffling, not to say downright eccentric magazines, newspapers, weeklies, journals, remaindered and suppressed books, and prospectus prospectuses, the very names of which are frequently productive of rival, ribaldry or conducive to nausea. Only the cast-iron constitutions of professional scholars can solemnly digest their contents with the bowels of compassion. But that was not all. That was only a major misfortune. To make tragedy complete, Poe had gathered his writings together, story and verse, he had revised and re-edited them, added many improvements and corrected minor errors, and then he left them in the care of his most bitter and relentless enemy and died. Scarcely was Poe's body cold before Rufus W. Griswold, his literary executor, was out in the New York papers with what, under the guise of an, obit of an obituary, amounted, amounted to a major defamation of the poet's character to his subtle sneering at and depreciation of his work. Rufus W. Griswold was the ablest American anthologist of his time. He had a keen nose for talent, but a jaundiced eye for genius, since jealousy was a large item in his personality. Poe had from time to time offended him and also given evidence of genius. Griswold's revenge was to attack Pope posthumously. He delayed the publication of the material that had been left in his hands, and when he did publish it, he published only part of it and disregard, disregarded many of Poe's corrections and emendations. All this occurred in the early 50s of the last century, meaning the 1800s. Thus, from the be very beginning, there was great difficulty in gathering and, and editing the work of Poe. Griswold had some, by no means all, of Poe's work, which was published under his auspices. There were a number of Poe's books, poetry, and verses, some of which, especially the earlier ones, were always difficult 
uh, often all but impossible to obtain. And there was, at, at, as mentioned be ab above, the body of the man's work in various versions scattered through newspapers, magazines, and obscure publications, published in widely diverse and unexpected places, published whenever and wherever Poe had been able to get something into print. Nothing is more indicative of the true genius of this writer than, his, than that his fame survived and continued to increase despite the enormous difficulty of collecting his work. And, when once uh, something was retrieved of deciding what was to be the final and official text, for Poe put his writing, particularly his verse, through endless revisions, improving it and republishing it constantly. It is only in our own day that the research of scholars and the work of textual critics have come to rest in a more or less final agreement as to what is to be the standard version of Poe texts. Thanks to this agreement, this present collection is possible. And I'll be reading from this collection as we go along, but not in this recording. There is small space here to go into particulars about Poe's publications. A hasty and entirely general glance at the course of Poe's fame, with a brief mention of the various kinds of writings he left behind him, is all that can be attempted or need be expected in a non-critical preface. The survival of any writer's work is due much more to chance than most critics care to admit. That Poe survived at all was largely due to continued newspaper republication of The Raven and The Bells. From the instant of its appearance, The Raven became the most widely known of all American poems, and it has remained so to the present day. His short story, The Gold Bug, was also extremely popular and frequently repeated in print. Post says in a letter to a friend that he wrote the bird to run with the bug and that the bird beat the bug all hollow. The murders in the Rue Morgue also con continue to be read and reread, and the fall of the House of Usher. But in spite of all of this, his fame might well have lapsed. The Civil War and all that went with it felt like a, fell like a wet blanket of oblivion on most of his contemporaries. But Poe was taken up abroad, especially in France, where his personality, poetry, and prose, as well as his literary theories, fascinated the great poet Baudelaire, who did him the inestimable service of translating, his, translating him supremely well. In some cases, the translations are thought even to have surpassed the originals. From then on, Poe became a fructifying influence in French literature. No writer in English has so greatly affected modern French literature as Poe. Then, in a curious roundabout way, his theories and technique came back to us in America reflected directly from France or filtered through the medium of English letters, also much influenced from France. Briefly, Poe vastly influenced all modern poetry by the way he used imagery to evoke and suggest rather than to picture and photograph his, with words what he had to say. His method is subjective rather than objective, and the modern short story, particularly the tale of, of racial sanation, the detective story, for instance, is largely his invention. It is not too crude a way of putting it to add that the whole innumerable present generation of detective fiction is descended from the murders in the Rue Morgue by way of Sherlock Holmes. In verse, Poe's influence is too subtle and too ramified to trace here. Most modernists are unconsciously vastly indebted to him. To Helen, for instance, is a thoroughly modern poem. The imagery is evocative. Its logic is subliminal. His theories as to the proper construction and use of materials for the short story have become the stock in trade for thousands of, of successful trade writers, as well as the convenient machinery of some great ones. <laughs> 
Poe's fame at home was also kept alive by a long controversy about the nature of his personality. Carried on at first for personal and egotistic reasons by those who had met him when he was alive, and afterward by numerable psychologizers and theoristic biographers who, more interested in their own theories than in Poe, continued at least to bring tomes to his cenotaph when no complete silence has ever been observed. All this can be summed up, perhaps fairly enough now, nearly a century after Poe's death, by saying that the ultimate proof of an author's vitality, his final valid share in fame, resides in the positive magnetic power of his writing to attract the attention of large and varying areas of the reading public over long periods of time. The negative strength of his reputation lies in his ability to survive both the favorable and inimical criticism heaped upon his work and, and personality. Judged by this double touchstone, Poe's influence was electric and powerful. Many came to bury him rather than to praise him. Others almost buried him in praise, but he survived. Yet it was not the tragic, ghostly story of the man himself, Rather, it was that man's haunting stories, his wonderful poems, his lucid criticism, his subtle, melodious art that proved to have something magnetic and eternal about them. Tested for their potential of interest in the laboratory of time, they still register powerfully. Indeed, nothing more need be said of Poe's present fame than if he, were, if he himself were able to return he might be satisfied. He might, but of one thing we can be perfectly certain, he would not be astonished. For the life of Edgar Allan Poe was not a humble pilgrimage to the sequestered shrine of modesty. It was spent diligently, although with lapses, constructing and elaborating his own original cenotaph. If his ego too confidently embraces the stars, we are in the main the gainers by it. He aspired to be universal, and in that he failed. But his failure contained also the seeds of his success. His cogitations in prose and verse have extended human experience and literature in the directions of both heavens and hell. He became an angelic demonologist. He provided glimpses through a finely focused lens into the nether reaches of insanity. His grief for the loss of love and lovers is lyric, lovely, and immortal. In the atmosphere of a darkly luminous magician's crystal, he projects mystical vistas and subliminal landscapes, gardens of the spirit superna superna supernally beautiful, haunted by ineffable nostalgias, their green glades bright with the lost su sunshine of childhood, and the colors of the soul, and there are uh, entrees and interior aisles in those gardens that disappear into the perspective of solitude, midnight paths leading to the closed door of a tomb silent under the frosty light of shivering stars. On all this, Poe lavished an unparalleled aptness economy and originality of words and exquisite phrasing. His visions and mimes embody themselves and are sustained in an impossible reality on the wings of thoughtful sound. They and the world they live in are contained only but completely in the native lines in which they speak. It is a celestial, a foreign tongue, this language of Poe's, Yet somehow we are made to remember that we were once and still are familiar with it. At the sound of the lyre and voice of the angel Israfel, the zodiac halted and was mute. But Poe felt he could transcend such an amateur immortal performance. Perhaps he did so, but with a mortal theme. For always behind his arcana of eternity, through all the man's work, looms the black outline of the forest of oblivion where the night birds of death chatter triumphantly
where the snail of time crawls slowly over the coffins of humanity, leaving only a faintly phosphorescent trail. No one has done this kind of thing so well as Poe. No one else has limbed for us so unforgettably glimpses of the heart, heart's lost hesperides, archipelagos of love in demon-haunted oceans bounded by the night's plutonian shore. The end.